Hi, I'm Dr. Stefano Pescher, the Country Doc. Welcome to our fourth edition of High Stakes, a solution to the opioid crisis. Today we have two special guests. The first one is Jonathan Harris, former um, Commissioner for the Department of Consumer Protection here in Connecticut. We also have Melissa Bouchard, who is a cannabis advocate and consultant, along with Lois Arias, who is the director of the show and patient advocate as well. So welcome everybody, and um, we'd like to start with Jonathan. Welcome, and thanks so much for coming. Thanks for having me, Steph. I appreciate it, Doctor. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell me a little bit, Jonathan. You were the Commissioner of Consumer Protection, and what steps did you take at the time to sort of help with this whole opioid crisis? Yeah, so in Consumer Protection, we have the Drug Control Unit, amongst a bunch of other things that we do. Um, so we were very involved uh, in what needs to be a holistic solution. I mean, this is a huge public health crisis, as we know. And uh, it can only be solved if it is attacked at every single angle possible by as many people as possible uh, throughout our communities because it's everywhere, right? It is in every single town in this state, in every single state in this nation, and beyond. I mean, uh, I, my family's been affected by it. Everybody that I talk to in some way has been affected to it uh, by it. So we tried to take that holistic approach within consumer protection. So there were three main areas of attack from what our powers were. First, uh, we oversaw the Prescription Drug Monitoring Program, which is the, the software platform that Connecticut and most other states uh, have to be able to monitor the prescribing of drugs. Uh, we've tightened up the law over the last couple of years uh, so as to be able to prevent diversion, doctor shopping, uh, ways that people used to get opioids, painkillers, the thing that are the source of many, uh, the beginning of many addictions uh, that continue on to heroin, fentanyl, and worse. Uh, we, were, we now require uh, all physicians uh, to check, and, and APRNs, anyone that's prescribing, uh, to check the PMP, as we call it, before prescribing, so you can see the patient's history. Uh, there are monitors that, and alarms that go off if there are uh, patterns of, of prescribing that might be dangerous. Uh, and pharmacists are required within a business day to enter all prescriptions uh, that are dispensed. So it's one tool that we have. Uh, the other is... Uh, drug disposal. Another way a source towards addiction is uh, people that are in your home, a family member, a friend that might go into your medicine cabinet and, and take uh, prescriptions. And so it's always best not to have a, uh, you know extra uh, painkillers, opioids, really any type of prescription around. And so we uh, sponsored a drug take back days. We uh, were uh, leading the charge to get drug disposal boxes, it was over 71 when I left, in police stations uh, throughout the state. Safe, secure, you can go and you can dump your pills right there uh, and it will be dispensed of appropriately. The thing that is the easiest way that we try to teach people um, and somehow it doesn't spread as far uh, is that you can dispose of dangerous drugs right in your house. Basically just take a cottage cheese container or some kind of container, uh, take the prescriptions, mash them up, kind of melt them down with a little hot water, put in something like a kitty litter or a used coffee grounds that are distasteful to a human or an animal, and seal it, tape it up, duct tape best, and you can throw it right in the uh, solid waste disposal, mm -hmm. right in your garbage that's can. Great to know. Um, so that's one other thing. Uh, and then finally, uh, we were uh, given responsibility uh, to train and certify pharmacists that we regulate uh, to prescribe naloxone. Uh, or the brand name Narcan, which of course is the uh, opioid antagonist that can save someone's life when they're, um, when they're overdosing. Uh, our approach was not just to uh, train a pharmacist to say, okay, here's how it's prescribed and here's how you use the particular kit, um, but also holistically to try to use it as a point where we can uh, get people into uh, recovery uh, or prevention 
uh, in some cases too, when, when it's the onset of uh, an addiction coming on. Because at the point that that person comes in or the caregiver to try to get the naloxone or Narcan, there's a higher percentage chance that they'll grab onto information. So we require the pharmacist to uh, learn about the prevention and recovery uh, resources within their area, uh, to have information on hand, to talk about best practices in an overdose, not just the Narcan, how to save lives, and to really use that point of contact as another way to provide information to save lives. So those are the, the basic areas that we focus on. And then we can talk about medical marijuana at some point. Too. Yeah, yeah, of course, you know, that sounds like a... So, you know, apart from that, um, how should we address the opiate crisis, all of us? I mean, are we doing the right thing by spreading awareness and educating and offering up holistic solutions? I mean, I think education is one of the cornerstones of, of, of how we can help people understand what's going on and why it has slipped so far. That's very important. And, you know, in all my public and private sector jobs, whether when I was mayor of West Hartford or a uh, state senator, a deputy treasurer for the state or commissioner of consumer protection helping to work on this problem or to give people the information they need to avoid being scammed, have their identity stolen. Uh, information is, is crucial in every single uh, step of the way. But we also need resources. I mean, let's face it. Uh, we can provide all the Narcan uh, that we need to. We can monitor prescriptions. We can do everything. But if we don't have enough treatment beds, so that when someone o overdoses and they're saved by the Narcan, they have a place to go that's safe where they can begin recovery. Mm -hmm. If we don't have enough programs, even if we have a bed that are long enough, a lot of times uh, the treatment programs are cut off after 30 days when people need 45, 60, 90 days. It, we really have to start figuring out ways that we can focus more resources, not just attention on the problem. But educating attention can lead to consensus and a better use of resources to have more holistic solutions to this, you know, just horrible problem. Yeah. And one of the holistic solutions that we've talked about in this show has been medical cannabis. Right. And as many of us can attest to, we've seen multiple addicts um, that have really benefited from the medical cannabis and they've been able to come off of their narcotics with very few problems or issues. They seem to be able to do it on their own just about. Right. Um, what are your thoughts on this? Well, we received a lot of anecdotal information, a lot of stories from people uh, that when they had access to the medical cannabis, uh, having been addicted to painkillers, to opioids, they were able to get off them and they were able to have a safer, more healthy way to treat their pain, their symptoms, uh, and other issues, other health issues. So the, the information was out there. We actually started in the state the first research program in the country, really, most of the research on the federal government has to, been to show how evil cannabis is, but not to look mm. into its beneficial uh, medicinal uses. Uh, and one of the, and the first actually state research program was uh, at St. Francis Hospital in the greater Hartford area, and they were studying the use of the medical cannabis to treat severe pain from uh, really severe rib injuries. Uh, and they were seeing the benefits uh, of that. In the states that have medical cannabis programs, there has been a bending down. There was a study done several years ago. In some cases, it's a bending down of the curve of the prescribing of opioids and other dangerous painkillers. So as an alternative, it is another one of the uh, methods of attack. I guess like another you know, arrow in the quiver, if you will, uh, to try to uh, prevent opioid addiction and the, the, the horrible consequences of it. Yes, and the medical cannabis is a natural substitute and has less side effects and less issues associated with its use. So it's a kind of a no-brainer and uh, we've been seeing it in our practice um, a lot as well. People have just done very well on this and these are not um, necessarily teenagers, 20-year-olds. These are 70-year-olds, 80-year-olds that um, couldn't take the Percocet or who accidentally overdosed because they that couldn't was get a grip yeah. on their pain. So the um, medical did. cannabis has become a real blessing. Right, and you don't overdose on the medical cannabis, you can't. right? Yeah. Right, it's that's not going to happen. Yeah. Uh, and as far as the addictive qualities of it, it is you know nothing compared to uh, you know the, the physical addiction that you get from an opioid and some of these other dangerous painkillers. Yeah, Melissa, you've seen a lot of 
success stories in your work. Could you talk a little bit about it? Sure. Um, one of the things before we talk about success stories, though, is that I find is unfortunately um, with these programs that get implemented, then we start to see doctors sort of being afraid to prescribe medicine to some of their patients. So I found, you know, 70 year old patients, like you were mentioning, who out of nowhere are completely cut off from their opioids and they're just, you know, quivering yeah, and screaming. Desperate. So their children are desperate for help. Yeah. And so that's sort of how they've come into you know, some of our holistic treatment is, you know, they're at their wit's end and they're really desperate. Um, and so a lot of the time that's how we've sadly been able to turn folks into believers is because they've had no other option besides this. So gratefully we've been able to change some of these laws and I hope to continue to work together. But yeah, my main thing is education um, so that we can help break through the stigmas and kind of help people realize the benefits of this. The patients that I've seen as far as being treated are just, I mean, it's a drastic difference when we, we talk about cannabinoid receptors and things like that. Uh, when when folks are overprescribed opioids for so long, uh, they tend the medicine tends to not work for them. But the cannabis is tapping into a completely different set of receptors. So when that happens, uh, we tend to see almost a miracle happen, and uh, a lot of great benefits happen within a small amount of time. You so. saw me before and after. Yeah, you I helped me with my recovery. I was very Dr. Yeah. Pesha. Hmm. Yeah, and it, you you worked hard, Lois. I know you're always giving everyone else credit, but I, I really like to put the power back in the hands of the people that are making the changes for themselves, right? So um, the tools are out here. That's the thing I think that we need to let folks know the most is that we created access now. We're creating access. It's not perfect. It's not foolproof, but we're getting there, and the information's there. The resources are there. The help is there. Um, so it's up to folks to empower themselves uh, and start to make that change. It's here now. You know, folks aren't going to get arrested for these things. Um, you know, if we're abiding by the law and doing the things that, that, you know, and hopefully changing the law to make room for everybody to, to fit into this program. Um, but a lot of folks, you know, the, the laws, the tides are changing. I know we, I say we used to see red and green, red and uh, blue states, and now we see green states, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> so, Can I pick up on a couple of those things? Yeah, yeah please. please. I, yeah. I, you, you make a really good points. And uh, one of the things uh, that is crucial here is, you know, we used to treat all addiction I shouldn't say all, a lot of addiction beyond alcohol addiction as a criminal problem, not a public health problem. Exactly. And it's moving in the direction that people shouldn't be thrown in jail because they have an addiction problem. And we have to realize that it's a health problem and attack it from that angle. And so that's crucial. And it's changing. And we have to keep that changing and make sure that people that have problems with their records in the past because of addiction are not denied the ability to have a job and have a quality of life that they deserve. And so that's key. And the other piece of it, and it's true, I mean, and I, I've heard you know, what you went through and what you, what you did, and that, that is a, you know, an expression of human will and, and strength and, you know, and just a, a spark of life. Um, but we also have to make sure that we don't take uh, that so far because I get some really nasty Facebook posts and things mm -hmm. like that when talking about addiction that, uh, you know, tell them just to snap out of it. You know, no. it's all a matter of free will, and mm -hmm. anyone can do whatever they want to do, and it's not a medical problem, essentially, mm -hmm. and that somehow it's just self-control. <laughs> and we got to erase people of that misconception. There yeah. is a serious mm -hmm. physical and health problem here, and we cannot just say you can just snap your fingers and have it go away. There's so much research and education and study. There's just so much studies that need to be done just so that folks can see what happens to the gray matter in the brain or right. what, what drugs do to a person's brain. But that's where this education and, and comes in because, you know, social workers, like folks can, if we can get them a bed, if we do find them a bed, um, a lot of the times the folks then want them to just, you know, follow the steps and be clean and marijuana is still considered a drug. So there's a lot of red tape to jump through when it comes to, you know, being able to get the folks this help, you know, it becomes a big hurdle. Um, so I just like to see us be able to educate the social workers and the folks like that that are working in the treatment centers. And I'll tell you what, I, when I used to work, you know, crossroads homeless, I was an HIV counselor. I, I supervised a needle exchange program. I taught a Narcan class when I was doing those things and doing in the midnight hour outreaches and things like that and working with drug addicts. Um, I remember one patient would say, I would really, was really trying to help this person. And, um, he would say, I don't have HIV. I am HIV. And it took me a while to understand what he meant. Um, and the drugs had just so overtaken him. You know, he was just so sick that he had become it. And he didn't even know who he was anymore. 
right? And so these, when, when we talk about addiction, it really is a public health crisis because I took it upon myself to say, you know, my son has to grow up in this world. And here we have a person who doesn't want my clean needles, who's so sick, right? When we talk about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, their most basic needs cannot be met. They can't, you know, find, they're sick. These people are actually sick. Um, and so it's going to affect us all. And if we don't do something about it, if we just brush it off and say, oh, well, they better just snap out of it. Um, a lot of us have other addictions too, right? And it mm -hmm. takes time. You know, it's not just drugs that are addicting. So it's not quite as easy as folks make it, it out and, to be. And, and a lot of the times, I mean, and Ken has, has this right just in the name of one of our departments. It's a department, a department of mental health and addiction services. There are underlying mental health issues that go hand in hand. Uh, and you know with addiction so we have to you know keep on understanding and treating the underlying mental health challenges that people yeah. have and also keep moving in the direction Connecticut was a leader of this back from when we did mental health parity many years ago but mental health is the same as physical health mm -hmm. it is tied together everything solutions and underlying causes are holistic and we can't keep on making it like mental health is something different than physical health yeah, and there's another department we can talk about, mental health, and then the Department of Corrections. And it's sad it that really addicts kind of either go one way or the other, right? right. And so, unfortunately, a lot of them fall through the gaps. And it's if they can't get the help through mental health, they end up, you know, clogging our systems. 50% are nonviolent drug offenders. With this recidivism rate is crazy. The money that it costs. So if we start channeling these folks, and instead of giving them 30 days to get their stuff together, right, and then dumping them back to the curb, if we gave them, like you mentioned, those 90-day programs, that intense treatment to, to heal from the traumas that we've discussed in prior episodes, um, I think that's where our money, and you know, we're, we're really going to start to pay off and start to see folks sort of then actually break the cycle. And as I've said before, people who become addicts are sensitive people. They're not bad people. They can't cope with the world. And so they take it, I took it for emotional pain. And then later on, I had chronic physical pain. But before someone becomes an addict, there's a reason. You wouldn't yeah. look down on someone who has diabetes. Yeah, I know people that are addicts that are some of the strongest people that I know. And it's not necessarily agreed to a point that, that they can't cope, but how much can a person cope with? How much is the person mm -hmm. supposed to, you know, sometimes, you know, we don't understand what goes on behind that addiction. And frankly, there doesn't need to be excused. People get cancer, they get sick, and it's our job to help them. Mm -hmm. These folks are sick. Oh, that's excellent. And Jonathan, just uh, a slight switch in gears here. I mean, yeah. how do you see the medical marijuana program changing in the future? Well, I see it continuing to develop on its natural course. When I uh, was commissioner, uh, right after the, the medicine first went online, there were basically 1,400 patients, about 80 or so physicians that were prescribing. Uh, now, when I left in April of this year, there were over 17,000, now it's well over 20,000 patients, uh, probably mm -hmm. nearing 1,000 physicians and now APRNs that can prescribe. We, of course, have torn down a lot of the stigma attached to this plant, this natural plant that can be used for a lot of different things, have let people know that uh, medical cannabis is not all about the THC, the psychoactive, getting high. There are all these other mm -hmm. cannabinoids, the CBDs, that have beneficial uh, uh, health uh, applications for them. So it, it's been growing literally and figuratively over the years, and I think that'll continue. And another benefit to the state too, uh, besides the research and becoming that focus, it had already created several hundred good jobs in the state. That doesn't even include the labs that we're doing the testing, you know, everything's labeled. So like any other prescription, uh, you know exactly what you're getting, active and inactive ingredients. Um, there's supply chains. So it's also, you know, first and foremost, about healthcare, about good healthcare, and another choice for people suffering from some really, really serious conditions, some diseases. Uh, but it also has an economic benefit to it too, which helps give the resources uh, through taxes and, and fees to be able to attack the opioid epidemic and, and you know provide uh, education, healthcare, you, you name it. Uh, so it's important in that way too. The other piece, of course, is that we started in a very limited way. Uh, and this was before I got there, but the legislature needed to pass a bill that was focused and limited to get it passed to be able to start expanding it. Um, so it started with 11 debilitating conditions. Uh, when I left, there was 22, I believe, and there's been others approved, so that's moving up. I think at some point, it'll become just like any other 
prescription drug. Uh, and it'll be more in the mainstream, if you will, which is a good thing because of access. Uh, I do fear a, it a little bit, and if it gets sucked up into the big pharma model that we have, which is another you know, potential complicating factor in the opioid epidemic, um, then it will lose the kind of holistic model that you know, the country doc understands uh, tremendously. Definitely. And that it's not just about providing medicine, it's about diet, it's about exercise, whether it's yoga, Reiki, you know, whatever you need to do because to deal holistically with the underlying medical and perhaps sometimes the psychological issues that uh, people are suffering from. So I really hope that, you know, that we're able to grow the program in a way that's steady, deliberate, thoughtful like we have been but in a way that it makes it a standalone model so that it is not crushed uh, once the federal government gets the, the Neanderthal attitude towards the plant out of their head and says, yeah, guess what? It's a drug, but there's medicinal value to it. Mm -hmm. Pretty simple. That's the reason why they've had it patented or for, no, have it patented for so long. Yeah. 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 So I have a yeah. question. Um, pharmaceutical companies are trying to make synthetic marijuana. Is there a way to fight it? You know, uh, there are always ways to fight things, but they're allowed to do research. Mm -hmm. And, you know, maybe some of that will be positive. I, I can't predict what that's going to be. And, and I don't want to just bang on the drug companies mm -hmm. because there are beneficial things that, that pharmaceutical companies, some right within a stone's throw of where we are, provide. But, you know, everybody, but this is healthcare. So there's always that strange mix between sort of the profit side and the treatment side mm -hmm. and we have to always be cognizant of that and create a, a value or a, a balance there because you know i'm one that believes that healthcare, access to health care is not something that you should be able to buy and get more if you have more money but it's a, a basic right and everybody mm -hmm. should be entitled to a, a decent level a good level of quality and affordable uh, health care so that mix is always uh kind of in that balance you got to always look to achieve. Mm -hmm. One of the things as an advocate that I try to point out when fo it, folks spend all this money trying to create something that we already have that works, right? So THC is not a bad thing. And then, you know, CBD is not a bad thing. Folks are trying to create it in a synthesized way and, and fake it, but we have it in real form. So I think it's just important for these companies to work with whole plant extractors and folks that are in the business that already are, are doing work. Um, and for these bigger companies to come in and start researching the actual plant because there's nothing cheaper if they want to make money There's nothing cheaper than something you can grow in natural sunlight. That's true. That's true And it provides us with another <clears throat> use of older buildings that we have Repurposing, another way yeah. another uh, crop for farmers uh, in the state to be mm -hmm. able to grow and be out whether it's you know the cannabis or hemp yeah. which is another piece so there are all these parts that we can use not only to do good, but also to provide a much more stable, larger, uh, and safe revenue base for, for the state. There were tax incentives until 1937 all across the board for, for hemp farmers. Hemp's known to grow the textiles, farms, it makes gasoline, wood, when you look at a piece of wood and how much deforestation that we have, if you look at the piece of wood, it's actually grown in kind of little snippets, and that's why when all these hurricanes and things happen, it breaks. The hemp stalk grows like seven feet long of just strong material, you know? So there's, there's actually reasons why we should grow that, because as we can harvest three crop, crops, four crops annually, or it takes forest generations to grow, you know, so the land here and states that kind of take on this model sooner than later are really going to be pioneers in this industry. I think. Textiles and other things, other products, and of course... The, the other CBDs because when it's point zero, yeah because yeah. point zero percent THC is mm -hmm. the legal level and then it yeah. is yeah. not industrial mm -hmm. or hemp anymore um, and there are a lot of uses of those oils that is you know doctor that are yeah. important patients have been doing very well with that stuff and it would be helpful to have some regulation right now it's kind of you're taking everybody's word for it there's yeah. it's only a it's considered a supplement I guess. But, um, and there yeah. are ways to actually ingest THC. It's called THCA. Yes. So THC, yeah. the only reason why it becomes psychoactive, and this goes back to that education piece, the only reason why it becomes psychoactive is because it's decarboxylized or activated, right? So if we don't do that and we leave that molecule in there and we just leave it and we don't convert it, we leave it at THCA, it's not, it doesn't affect you in the head. 
It's very similar to CBD, but the difference is now we can get that whole plant therapy. We can attach to all the different receptors. You know, we can kind of get that full mind body experience going on for the patient um, and be able to titrate their doses so minimally when folks, when we introduce a small amount, we talked about with that about Susan last yeah. time with her daughter, mm -hmm. when we introduce just that teeny amount of THC, it makes a great right. difference, but folks are afraid that it's going to affect their head, so just don't activate it, yeah. right? But these conversations need to be had between the labs, between the extractors, between the dispensaries, between, you know, politicians, all of that stuff, um, so that folks can be in the know about it, and it's a lot, maybe we can continue to break through that fear, I think. And Dr. Pesher does a wonderful service every month which is holding the cannabis seminar and it's open to the public and it's free. It's free. <laughs> and it just, it's an education for everyone who goes there and the patients interact. Um, I've become friends with people I've met there. Actually, I met Julie there who will be on later. And um, it's just a wonderful tool in addition to everything else you do. Well, well thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And it, I like what your point though on the, the Again, back to a holistic thing. One of the things about this plant that is amazing is, you know, again, let's like kind of compare it to a, a typical pharmaceutical, which is a molecule, right? Essentially, mm -hmm. now they have small molecules and now the large molecules, but essentially a molecule here, you have what I call the stew, yeah. but I guess technically it's called the entourage effect, <laughs> where you can have different levels of all the different chemicals in the plant, around 84 chemicals, right? And at different levels, they might do different things. Mm -hmm. And one of the other advances that we've had in this program is, and it shows with the you know the docs and others, you know, accepting it more, is they were very fearful at the beginning, especially when most of it was flour that was smoked that it couldn't be dosed appropriately. But now, with all the different forms, whether it's oils, gel caps, certain edibles, topicals, that you can actually you know are much more specific in being able to dose it, but you still have this more kind of holistic mix, this entourage stew mm -hmm. of different types of chemicals that can be adjusted. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Well said. <laughs> <laughs> and smoking it isn't the worst thing. It's the, one of the quickest ways to get it into yep. the bloodstream. We have folks with all sorts of shakes and tremors and conditions that that could be, a, it's, it's a real rescue matter. You can vaporize it. We have to remember if it's, you know, if it's gold in, gold out. So if we're, if we're creating a good plant, a holistic plant that's, you know, properly grown and cured properly and flushed properly and not chemical based, you know, when you're smoking it, it's just an herb now. So it's not like you're smoking a cigarette or, you know, things that are swept off the floor, you know, when it's grown right. properly, um, smoking it can be, you know, great medicine as well. It right. works quicker that way. It is the fastest way. And we know, and doctor, you probably have a much bigger experience with this than of course than I do, but uh, patients that have several different types of products depending on whether they're going to work, whether they need yeah, to exactly. affect them quickly. Them. Different, there are different ways that it can, mm -hmm. delivery systems and different you know, mixes of the chemicals that can be used at various points to treat what they're actually suffering from at that point in the day. Yeah, that's exactly right. So you'll have somebody, like Melissa said, they might vape the medication for a quick effect. They may layer it with an edible, which will take two hours to kick in but will last six to eight hours, so it's a perfect nighttime medication. You know, there's different ways to play with it, but there is a lot of trial and error. Um, and so it takes some patience and diligence and writing things down in a notebook, coming to the class to learn more, educating yourself. I never thought that I'd be able to be off sleeping pills. I had been taking them since I was 18, and now CBD, I sleep like a baby. Yeah, perfect. So an appetite suppressant as well. Mm -hmm. so. so do you think that marijuana will be legalized in Connecticut? Yes, I think within the next couple of years it will be. I mean, let's face it, it's, uh, it's everywhere besides the black market. Uh, it's legal now in Massachusetts. It's coming to Rhode Island, I'm told, probably to New York. So the idea that it's not here, we can't stick our heads in the sand. So we have to be thoughtful, deliberate, like we have been on the medical program, and figure out what is the best way to regulate it? And luckily we'll have states right in our neighborhood and others in other parts of the country that we can look to for best practices mm -hmm. and figure out how to do it in an appropriate way. Um, I think it needs to be done because it's good public policy to do it. We need to make sure though that it does not interfere with the medical program. The medical has to be a standalone program and that while retail may have some medical value and provide additional access 
to people to the plant uh, that can be used medicinally, we still want to make sure that we maintain that program, which we call the three P's of the medical program, physician, pharmacist, and patient. So there's a medical piece to it, like your classes and, and all the, uh, you know, the advice and therapy that you give in addition to providing access to the medicine. So do it because it's good public policy. Then it'll have an additional benefit of some more revenue so that we can actually deal with some of these other issues, whether it's the opioid crisis, awareness, other pieces uh, that we need to deal with. Um, after we take into account the fact that there's going to be a cost to regulate it and that there will be some social costs, we also have to recognize that up front and be prepared for that. Uh, we will have additional revenue that we can have. So do it for good public policy in a thoughtful, deliberate way and kick off some more re revenue to help us um, solve some of these problems. Perfect. I have to give you credit for what you've done with the medical program because yes. I, I watched you take it and run with it. I, I come from a stayed a little north of you, and it's, it took us a long time. <laughs> it was a team to, uh, really to, Yeah, team. and it's certainly a snowball effect, um, and a lot of the work, I admit, we trailblazed, but you, you certainly took it in a very professional way, and you just you made it happen. You were strategic about it that first time we talked at that class. Mm -hmm. I was very impressed with your openness and willingness, willingness to just say it like it is and be willing to, to answer the tough questions and, and kind of be cutting edge and real about it. So you've seen, I've seen a lot of patients helped because of uh, the work that you've done. So. Well, I'll tell you, it's a model of public policy and problem solving in the state. If we're really in the state and in this country, let's face it, want to get over some serious challenges that we have, and we can because we have the brains, we have the people, we have the assets, we've got to start bringing people together, listening to one another, and actually creating practical solutions. And at times that means leaving your ideology and other things at the door mm -hmm. and sitting down and working with people, and that's really what's important. And so I think all been participants in this it shows it can be done well and Jonathan thank you and I thank I you. also understand that you're exploring a run for governorship is that right I am I'm exploring a run for statewide office potential candidacy for governor I want to kind of take some of that uh, public experience that I talked about as mayor as state senator deputy treasurer and commissioner of consumer protection and I have my own real estate and economic development business and I've also been a practicing attorney representing businesses and families for a couple decades. So kind of see what works with the government and the private sector, what doesn't work. I like to tell people I know what I know. More importantly, at my age, I know what I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but I also know, as we see around here, a lot of smart people that can, you know, fill in the details. But there is a way that we can get out of this rut in the state if we work together. And in the country. I agree. A politician just admitted he doesn't know everything. That's pretty well, good. <laughs> I wish I was in Connecticut. I'd vote for you. Thank you. Now I just have to move just because. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Jonathan, thank Melissa, you very much. and Lois. Yeah. And we're going to take a short public service announcement and we'll be back with our second fabulous guest, Doug Capasi, veteran. Thank you. There's a shelter pet who wants to meet you. Meet one today. Visit the shelterpetproject.org. Adopt. Hi, so we're back with our second guest um, at this fourth edition of High Stakes, A Solution to the Opioid Crisis. Welcome, Doug Capazzi. Thank you. Wonderful veteran of the U.S. Army, who is Thank also you. the president of the Guardians of the Purple Heart. And he also works, he's a director um, for Military Outreach Director for VETS, which stands for Veterans Equine Therapeutic Services. That's correct. So we're very excited to have you. And also Julie Banks is joining us today. She is an emotional wellness coach and um, provides emotional freedom technique and tapping to patients with um, post-traumatic stress disorder. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Julie, give us a little overview of what it means to be um, traumatized yeah. and have post-traumatic stress disorder. Sure, well, um, there, there are four things that characterize trauma. Um, one is it's something happens that's unexpected. Um, two, it is a perceived threat to um, survival. 
Um, three, you're left with feelings of hopelessness and then feelings of, of isolation. So when all four of these characteristics, characteristics of trauma are met, um, it's like the body takes a snapshot of everything that's seen, heard, smelt, tasted, and felt, and it gets sealed inside the brain's freeze response. And this is also can be known as a, a trauma capsule that's in the brain. Um, so when something now is seen, heard, smelt, um, tasted, or felt, that mirrors then, um, the trauma capsule, be capsule begins to leak and, and it opens. And, and, you know, when the trauma capsule leaks, you know, the emotion of the past event um, is re-experienced and the fight, flight, or freeze response is activated. Um, the past trauma hijacks the present moment um, and we dissociate from the present and uh, we become stuck in the past. So here's where PTSD symptoms emerge. Um, as, that, as that's leaking out, we get increased anxiety, depression, uh, sleep disturbances, um, angry outbursts, flashbacks, uh, nightmares. And, and this really is what drives people to self-medicate, uh, to opiates or other drugs or alcohol. Um, so, so we really need, you know, a technique like what I do, EFT, that can help gently, it, it's like a gentle exposure while we tap, we calm the amygdala down, but we tune into that, whatever happened to us, and it, and it disarms that, it, dis, it disarms the contents of the trauma capsule. So, you know, the trauma can be healed. Thank you. Yeah. That's very interesting. So, yeah. um... You know, one of the modalities we have for treatment of um, trauma that then leads to addiction in many cases, as Julie said, the self-medication, um, is emotional freedom technique and tapping. But there are other services out there that we thought the public should know about that are really valuable and helpful. So Doug here, um, firsthand, knows a lot about this, and I'm going to let him speak freely. <laughs> Um, but also, Doug, afterwards, you know, tell us about yourself and your journey. But I'd love to hear more about the therapeutic horseback riding that has been able to rewire patients with PTSD and help them over that hurdle. Okay. Uh, first off, in 2003, I was deployed to Kuwait at the initial start of the conflict. Um, and then in 2005 to late 2006, I was deployed strictly to Iraq. And what you were talking about, about the whole PTSD, I can relate because the nightmares, the sleeplessness, the uh, angry outbursts, uh, things of that nature happen every day for me. Um, I have been diagnosed with PTSD, chronic adjustment disorder, depression, anxiety, stress, all that stuff. So every day it's still a constant, it, you know, it's still a constant battle. Even though I'm not in the war zone, I'm still kind of in the war zone per se. Um, I've tried many different forms of therapy, talking to people, stuff like that, but it's not for everybody. Mm -hmm. And then I came across the VETS program, the Veterans Equine Therapeutic Services. I uh, just met them through uh, a function that the organization, organization I'm president of. We had them at our event, and they were like, yeah, come on out, take a look, you know, see what we can do. And at first I was like, all right, horses, you know, how can these guys help me or whatever? So. I went through the first day and I was like, all right, I could see a little bit, went through this, you know, the following week and the next, you know, six weeks go by and I'm like, all right, let's sign up for another session. So I signed up for a second six week session. And then after that, I just turned around and said, I have to be on your board of directors. Like I have to get more veterans involved in this. I mean, it's, you wouldn't, you wouldn't think that being next to a horse or interacting with a horse would be as calming as it is. So through the program, you learn certain tricks and certain ways to basically calm yourself down. I had no idea horses were that intuitive. If I came to the farm and I went up to a horse and I was anxious or stressed, the horse would be able to pick up on it. And in turn, the horse would be acting the same way I was acting. So mm -hmm. therefore, you're not going to get any work done. But if you come and you're relaxed and you're calm and you're confident, the horse is going to pick up on that. Then the horse is going to be relaxed itself. There was many times that I went to work with a horse and <clears throat> I was just, just in past March, I went through a third back surgery, second spinal fusion. Mm -hmm. So I was under a lot of stress and I was in a lot of pain and there was a lot of walking. Well, the horse picked up on it and it was trying to mirror my pain by, you know, limping, 
by you know putting more weight on one side but in the horse doing that it kind of stressed me out because the horse wasn't cooperating <laughs> so I had to remove my, remove myself from the ring but I mean it's one of those things now where we have I think it's like four to six veterans a time in our program so there's like no room for me in the program <laughs> at this point so even though there's no room for me and I give the veterans the chance to go out there and experience them themselves, I still go out to the farm. I still hang out with the animals when they're doing their thing. I'll walk up out into the paddock. I'll, you know, be talking with the horses, just spending a couple of minutes with them, you know, cause that's my therapy now. It's every Saturday. I'm like, I got to go to the farm for a few hours. And it's, that's just how I just get away. Oh, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Have you um, participated in the exercise where the veterans sit in the middle of the arena and the horses choose their veteran? No, not yet. That's, haven't done that's that. phenomenal. <laughs> that's really an unbelievable thing. No, I haven't done yeah. that yet. I know there has been talk of that happening. Yep. Um, it's, it's just a matter of how many horses we can get that day, how many veterans are available. Um, one of the things that we try to keep in mind is that, especially for somebody like me, if there's too many veterans, too many instructors, too many horses, and too many people in one area, that's going to be a trigger. So we have to worry about triggers as well. So someplace that's going to be crowded with a lot of confusion and commotion and stuff, that's going to make me anxious, or it might make somebody else anxious. So we kind of have to keep that in mind too, to make sure that we don't trigger anything that's going to bring you know a flashback like open up that capsule you were talking about we don't want anything like that we try to create a serene environment where you can i like to tell veterans when they're asking me like what is it like i literally tell them you drive down the, the road you get out of your car it's like stepping into narnia you know it's like a completely different world it's quiet it's calm it's peaceful even though there might be a lot of people around and stuff it is just i mean it's one of the most serene environments i've ever been in that's um, Horses Healing Humans Correct. Um, off 184 yep. in Stonington, Connecticut. Yes, ma'am. Yes, and that's really um, been a blessing, that ranch. And I have to say, Jessica Morrissey, who's not here with us today, but she played an instrumental role in uh, acquiring that property for yeah. veterans and yes. other patients, of course. Yes. But, the best part is it's yeah. free to veterans too. Yes. So a be. lot of these programs, a lot yeah. of stuff that veterans want to participate in, it costs them money. And financial struggles isn't one of the things that veterans deal with. And I mean, everyone deals with it, but it's something that we can just sit there and say, well, you can come out to the program and you can play with horses and whatnot. You do it for free. And then, there, then people are like, oh, okay, maybe I'll give it a shot. Is there anything you do around the holidays? Because the holidays can be a trigger for people. It can cause a relapse. And at the end of the show, we're going to have a uh, slide up with the suicide hotlines. But do you find there's anything that you can do to help with that? Uh, it's different for everybody. But for me, it's just I try to surround myself with family and friends. Um, I have lost a lot of friends, you know, either overseas itself or due to suicide. Um, so it's very tough for me to, you know, want to pick up the phone and call them and see how they're doing or send out a message on Facebook or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I just try to surround myself with friends and family and that's pretty much it. It takes a village. Yeah, <laughs> it really well, it does. It certainly does. And thank you for your service. Oh, thank you for the support. Yeah, thank you, Doug. So tell us more about the um, Purple Guardians of the Purple Heart. What is that? So this organization has actually been around for like the last five years. And our founder, Brent Walker, who is a uh, Purple Heart recipient himself, started just doing a motorcycle run for about the first three or four years. Um, and then at the end of the poker run, he would take all the money that he had pretty much gathered. It was donated. He would donate it to the Wounded Warrior Project. Uh, but then he kind of sat back, he took a year off, and then he was like, I want to make it more personal. I want to make it so it's more of a one-on-one -on -one type situation. Um, so then he got into just maybe picking one Connecticut combat wounded veteran and then assisting them. So in late, I think it was like November 2015, he had asked me if I just wanted to be a part of the organization. So I said, yeah, okay, cool. 2016 rolls around and then he asked me if I want to become president. Hmm. So then all from 2016 to 2017, uh, we restructured the organization. We rebranded the organization. We became a 501c3 certified 
nonprofit within the state of Connecticut. Um, we joined the uh, Eastern Connecticut Chamber of Commerce. Um, and what we do is we specialize in obtaining items or services that aren't being met by other organizations such as the VA for Connecticut combat wounded vets. So for instance, in 2016, we had a Vietnam veteran who would, couldn't get a mobilized scooter from the VA. Mm -hmm. He was shot in the foot, he had oh, Agent goodness. Orange and all this stuff, and he, he would have trouble walking. But the VA was like, no, sorry, we can't give you a mobilized scooter. And that's where people get upset. They're like, well, the VA should be able to give it to you. Mm -hmm. But like any business and corporation, they have their corporate red tape that they have to follow. That just fell outside their corporate red tape. So we came in and we were able to get a mobilized scooter donated to the organization and then we donated it to him. Very nice. And then this past year, we had an Afghanistan vet from Enfield who was uh, PTSD, TBI, um, agoraphobia. What's TBI? Um, a traumatic brain injury. Thank you. Uh, agoraphobia, which is the fear of um, like there's no escape. In closed um, spaces. Right. And yeah. it was tough for him to hold a job. So it was tough for him to make money. So what we did is instead of trying to find a service or an item that we can give him, we actually helped him with his relocation process down to Kentucky. Hmm. So we we try to make big moves in a little organization. That's great. That's wonderful. Yeah, really terrific. Yeah. So um, maybe um, tell us a little bit about the people that you work with so that we honor them as well. Because um, you guys, have, you're a good team there. We... Yeah. The, we're a team of seven. Out of the seven, three of us are veterans. Um, everyone else that's on our team is either a family member of a veteran or a veteran supporter. Um, and it's, we help anybody. I mean, we have, there was like things three weeks ago, four weeks ago, my phone rang and it was actually a veteran that I had met months before who had my business card. And the first words out of his mouth were, Doug, I'm thinking about committing suicide. And it was... The phone call is never easy to get and you mm -hmm. kind of go into panic mode. But at that point, it was like, all right, I had to take a step back. I had to breathe, calm down. And then I kind of walked him through, you know, the, the process, talk to him, listen to him, you know, I let him talk. I mean, I always tell people and a lot of people don't realize that as humans, we listen with the intent to respond. Like as you're talking to somebody, that person that you're speaking to has their next question or statement in their head. We don't listen with the intent to understand. So I just listened. And believe it or not, after about 20, 25 minutes on the phone with this guy, it was like, all right, yeah, you're right. I'm good. I'm all set now. <laughs> he just needed you to listen. Yeah. What yeah. a blessing. Yeah. So yeah. it's 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 a lot of hard work. We, uh, you know, we, I probably spend anywhere between 20, 30, 40 hours a week doing stuff for the organization, trying to make, you know, new connections, stuff like that. I'm trying to bring more veterans on board. Um, we work closely with the VETS program. So we'll have a veteran who has PTSD and we'll start talking with them. And we kind of use it like a little segue to get them into uh, working with horses. We're like, oh, hey, I'm going out to the farm on Saturday. You know, let's just hang out and whatnot and see what happens. We'll bring them down to the farm and next thing you know, they're enrolling in the program. So we're working hand in hand with VETS to you know, just helpfully change the lives of the veterans who actually need it. Do you have a website or anything? That we do have a to? website. Um, our website is gotph.org. Um, and then Facebook, they can just find us at Guardians of the Purple Heart. So I think we'll be like number three on the list. Because when you start typing in Guardians of, you'll get Guardians of the Galaxy. Of course. So, <laughs> so That yeah. too, Doug. That too. Yeah. So you, if you look down, you just type in Guardians of. And as soon as you put the P mm. for Purple Heart, we're number one. will pop up. Okay. Well, it's a wonderful service that you do. Yeah. Yes. I love it. Yeah. So tell us a little bit more about, like, you know, we're trying to look at the whole substance abuse problem mm -hmm. and um, trying to catch people in a safety net before they get there. And so that's kind of how we're looking at vulnerable populations, mm -hmm. such as potential veterans who have gone through some terrible things and may have an inclination to self-medicate um, just to get through the pain, the trauma of it. Um, so this definitely is one modality, but how do you feel about other um, holistic therapies that we, for example, just talked about with uh, Jonathan Harris. Uh, I'm all for it. 
It's so a little backstory. I injured my back in 2006. Mm -hmm. um, so from 2006 to 2016, I was always in pain, um, losing feeling in my leg and my foot, constantly falling over. And it wasn't until late 2016 that they actually found that I had a broken bone in my back. Oh, um, okay. But that entire 10 years, doctors are giving me, you know, Percocets. They're giving me, you know, the pills. I mean, you open up my cabinet and I look like a VA pharmacy because it has all the VA labels on the bottle. But the problem with that is, is like anything, your body gets used to it. So they had to keep increasing the dosage and finally everything stopped working. So I wouldn't be able to take anything for the pain. So anything like medical marijuana, anything like that has been talked to me about my doctors and stuff, but because of my profession, it was like, no, sorry, we can't, you know, I can't even explore that route. But I do know people who do suffer from really bad nightmares, really bad flashbacks who have a lot of pain day in and day out. And I mean, they can't go to the mall, they can't go to anywhere, without the, the common joke is, I have my pen with me. You know, it's like, okay, so you're good. Um, so they can't do anything without that little bit of help that a pill will not be able to, to handle. So anything that has to do with medical marijuana for veterans, I'm all for it. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, and I find this very, like, very just scary, but not too long ago, I read an article that they're looking at getting away from medical marijuana for veterans but they want to treat PTSD with Molly or MDMA. <laughs> and I'm sitting there like, well, <sighs> what's the, the difference? That's Molly's. Yeah. Well, <laughs> we have a, <laughs> <expert> <laughs> a <conversation. laughs> you know, I don't know if the article Speak is true. That. I don't know if the article is true. I don't true, know about the article, but, but they're doing research on it right now. Tell yeah. us about that. The multidisciplinary Julie. association for psychedelic studies, um, has, a, is, is using MDMA for post-traumatic stress. And uh, so far, the results are, are promising. What is um, MDMA? It's um, it, it's it's ecstasy. Okay, it's a street name for it. I would have gotten yeah. that one. <laughs> but this is this is really pure. It's it's a hundred percent MDMA because it's stuff you get on the street. It has a lot of adulterants in it, and it affects the body in not good ways. But this is done um, in a psychotherapy assisted mm -hmm. sort of way. So it's an empathogen. So what it does is it you're you're guided by this therapist. Um, and you usually like have a mask on and music and, and you've set an intention and the idea is to go back into whatever is still upsetting you so much and because it's an, empath an empathogen, um, you make peace with yourself around whatever happened. So it, it actually can be very beautiful and um, I've heard really excellent things about it. Um, is it for everybody? No. But it's, it's definitely worth exploring. Um, I, I think there are some promising results here yeah, for sure you know the cannabis medical cannabis appears a little more um, okay. available it's definitely more mainstream and mainstream, <laughs> <laughs> mainstream. We, know, we know a little more about it we do but yeah, yeah. Well, i've heard um well years ago mdma was legal in the 80s and therapists hmm. were using it to bond with their clients better so it would it would help them build rapport and trust the therapist really? so it, would, it was breaking through that Barrier. kind of wall that would be up at first, and then so. it, yeah, and then it but then the whole a rave party scene drug. ruined it. <laughs> 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 then it became a party drug, and it all went downhill. <laughs> well, wonderful. Well, thanks so much, um, really, Doug. Thank you. Wonderful, and we're getting the message out there to the public that this is an available modality for free for mm -hmm. veterans. Um, and we'll put up your information. And Julie, thank you. Uh, and Lois, wonderful. And we'd like to have the kids come up here and join us for this uh, Our Christmas crew. episode. Our crew. Children. <laughs> that includes Sophia in the control room. Abby. I'm everyone, ready. Everyone, come up here, please. <laughs> come up here. Put on your hats. <laughs> <laughs> come this come is on. our wonderful crew. <laughs> come on. This is our wonderful TV crew. And Dr. Pesher's family. <laughs> They're amazing. Thank you, guys. All right, wonderful. So thanks again for joining us. Um, and we wish you all the best through this holiday season. Merry Christmas and a wonderful new year. And we're also going to put up that hotline for Suicide. people who may not be feeling very well and having a hard time so please take a note of this number 
um, and reach out to anybody who needs your help. Like Doug said, sometimes just listening makes a world of difference. And please go to our high stakes page yes. and our high stakes support group page. Yep. Wonderful. And we're there to help you. Thanks Thank you. so much. Thank you.